Hi everyone, this is Professor of Dust Science and today we will discuss the Pauli matrices in another one of our videos on rigorous quantum mechanics. The Pauli matrices are named after Wolfgang Pauli, one of the fathers of quantum mechanics and perhaps best known for the eponymous Pauli exclusion principle. There are three Pauli matrices of dimension two by two, and while they may look simple, we simply cannot overstate their importance in quantum mechanics. For example, they play an absolutely central role in the study of spin one half particles, such as the electron. And they're also the starting point to study any quantum system that can be described with a two dimensional state space. In this video, we will define the Pauli matrices and we will explore some of their most useful mathematical properties. So let's go. Let's go straight to the definition of the Pauli matrices. They are usually labeled with the Greek letter sigma, and the first one is sigma one, with entries 0, 1, 1, 0. The second one is sigma two, with entries zero minus i, i zero. And the third one is sigma three, with entries one zero zero minus one. These matrices play a key role in various areas of quantum mechanics, perhaps the most famous of which is for the description of spin one half particles like the electron. But more generally, they're also a building block for the description of any quantum system with a two dimensional state space. Given how widespread they are, the aim of this video is pretty straightforward. We're going to derive some of the most important mathematical properties of all of these Pauli matrices. The Pauli matrices are Hermitian, and remember that an operator or matrix A is Hermitian if it is equal to its adjoint. So let's confirm this explicitly by starting with the sigma 1 matrix up here. The adjoint of a matrix is defined as the complex conjugate of the transpose. In this case, the transpose is trivially the same, and then we just need to take the complex conjugate. As the entries of the sigma 1 matrix are real, the matrix is again unchanged, so the final result is the matrix 0, 1, 1, 0. And indeed, this is equal to sigma 1. Let's try sigma 2, which is slightly more interesting. The adjoint of sigma 2 is again equal to the transpose of the matrix, and then the complex conjugate, which flips the signs of the imaginary terms to get this, which is indeed equal to sigma 2. Finally, for the adjoint of sigma 3, we calculate the transpose conjugate, which is once again trivial to evaluate as the matrix is real, and we get sigma 3. These relations explicitly confirm that the Pauli matrices are Hermitian. The next property that we will investigate is the fact that the Pauli matrices are involuntary, which, remember, means that an operator or matrix A is equal to its own inverse. To show this explicitly, we will demonstrate that multiplying a Pauli matrix by itself yields the identity. So let's take sigma 1 squared first. We can write it out explicitly as sigma 1 times sigma 1. And applying the usual rules of matrix multiplication, we get 1, 0, 0, 1, which is the 2 by 2 identity matrix. This confirms that the inverse of the sigma 1 matrix is itself. So moving on to sigma 2 squared, we explicitly get this. Applying the usual rules of matrix multiplication, we end up with minus i squared, 0, 0, minus i squared, which reduces to 1, 0, 0, 1, which is indeed the identity matrix. For sigma 3 squared, we explicitly get this. Multiplying, we get 1, 0, 0, minus 1, all squared. And again, that reduces to 1, 0, 0, 1, which is again the identity matrix. These relations confirm that the Pauli matrices are their own inverses. And here I'm using the subindex k to refer to a generic Pauli matrix. So k runs from 1 to 3. In the previous slide, we've already established that the Pauli matrices are Hermitian. 
bringing these two insights together, we can conclude that the inverses of the Pauli matrices are equal to their adjoints, which means that the Pauli matrices are also unitary. Next, we're going to look at the determinant of the Pauli matrices. For a general two by two matrix A, the determinant is really easy to calculate. We just multiply the two diagonal elements together and then subtract the multiplication of the two off diagonal terms. With this, the determinant of the sigma one matrix is zero minus one, which is minus one. The determinant of the sigma two matrix is zero minus minus i squared, which is minus one. And the determinant of the sigma three matrix is minus one minus zero, which is also minus one. So all Pauli matrices have the same determinant, which is minus one. Great, so the next property we're going to study is the trace of the Pauli matrices. For a general two by two matrix A, the trace is simply the sum of the diagonal elements. We can trivially see that the trace of sigma one is zero, the trace of sigma two is also zero, and the trace of sigma three is one minus one, which is also zero. So that means that all the Pauli matrices are traceless. Let's move on to the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of the Pauli matrices. And this is a bit more exciting, perhaps. We'll take the sigma one Pauli matrix as an example and write its eigenvalue equation. As always, these lambda are the eigenvalues and these phi, the eigenvectors. To find the eigenvalues, we need to consider the characteristic equation of sigma one. The terms in brackets here are the sigma one matrix minus lambda times the identity matrix, which evaluates to minus lambda one one minus lambda. So we therefore need to evaluate the determinant of this matrix and set it to zero. We have the product of the diagonal terms minus the product of the off diagonal terms equal to zero. And this leads to lambda equals to plus minus one. Therefore, the eigenvalues of the sigma one Pauli matrix are plus one and minus one. So let's make some room. Starting with the eigenvalue plus one, we can write out the corresponding eigenvalue equation where I am now labeling the eigenvector V with the subindex plus to indicate that it corresponds to the plus one eigenvalue. Writing this out, we get this matrix equation we can multiply these two terms together to end up with this column vector on the left hand side equal to the column vector representing the eigenvector. Comparing the first entry here with the first entry here, we arrive at the conclusion that V2 plus is equal to V1 plus. Therefore, the normalized eigenvector is equal to one over square root of two times the vector one, one. Repeating the same exercise for the eigenvalue minus one, we would find that the normalized eigenvector is equal to this expression. Let's make some room again. We've now established that for the Pauli matrix sigma one, the eigenvalues are plus one with this normalized eigenvector and minus one with this other normalized eigenvector. I would encourage you to repeat the same exercise for the other two Pauli matrices but what we will do here is to simply quote the final results. For sigma two, we also have that the eigenvalues are plus one and minus one, and we get this eigenvector for plus one, and this eigenvector for minus one. And for sigma three, we also have that the eigenvalues are plus one and minus one, and the eigenvector for plus one is one zero, and the eigenvector for minus one is zero one. We're now going to consider the commutation relations between the Pauli matrices, and remember that the commutator of two matrices or operators A and B is equal to AB minus BA. We will look at a particular example, the commutator of sigma one and sigma two. We can expand out this expression to get sigma one, sigma two 
minus sigma 2 sigma 1. Focusing on the first term, we can spell it out by writing sigma 1 and sigma 2. Using matrix multiplication, we get i0, 0 minus i. Now for the second term, we now first spell out sigma 2 and then sigma 1. And multiplying, we obtain minus i, 0, 0 i. Going back to the commutator, we need this product sigma 1, sigma 2, which gives this term, minus the product sigma 2, sigma 1, which gives this other term. So evaluating this expression, we obtain 2i, 0, 0, minus 2i, which we can simplify as 2i multiplying the matrix 1, 0, 0, minus 1. So we see that this matrix is actually sigma 3, and we end up with 2i sigma 3. So overall, going back to the top, the commutator of sigma 1 and sigma 2 is equal to 2i sigma 3. Let's make some ROM. We could repeat this exercise for all other possible pairs of Pauli matrices. And again, I, I'm going to really encourage you to try it out because it's a great way to get familiar with operator algebra. But what we are going to do today is to simply write out the final result, which is that the commutator between sigma 2 and sigma 3 is equal to 2i times sigma 1, and the commutator between sigma 3 and sigma 1 is equal to 2i times sigma 2. And all other commutators will vanish trivially. For example, the commutator of sigma 1 with itself is equal to 0. We can summarize these expressions as the commutator of sigma j and sigma k being equal to 2i times the sum over l of epsilon jkl times sigma l, and where j, k, and l can take any value of 1, 2, and 3. This term here is called the levi civita symbol. If you've encountered the levi civita symbol before, that's great. If not, all you need to know is that the levi civita symbol is defined such that when the subindices are all different and they appear in the order 1, 2, 3, or any cyclic permutation of that, then it is equal to 1. If all subindices are different, but they appear in a cycle that does not have the order 1, 2, 3, then it is equal to minus 1, and for all other combinations, it is equal to zero. Now, whether you've encountered the levi civita symbol before or not, you should convince yourself that the compact expression here does indeed deliver all the relations that we have explicitly outlined up here. Overall, these commutation relations should look familiar if you've followed our videos on angular momentum. And indeed, the Pauli matrices are intimately related to the theory of spin angular momentum for spin one-half particles like the electron. And to learn more about this, you can watch our videos on spin. Finally, let's consider the anti-commutation relations between the Pauli matrices. And first, remember that the anti-commutator of two matrices or operators A and B is equal to AB plus BA. We'll again consider a particular example, the anti-commutator of sigma 1 and sigma 2. We can expand out this expression to get sigma 1, sigma 2 plus sigma 2, sigma 1. When evaluating the commutator, we've already established that the product sigma 1, sigma 2 is equal to i0, 0, 0 minus i, and the product sigma 2, sigma 1 is minus i0, 0, 0 i. As a result, for the anti-commutator, we get this matrix plus this matrix, and they combine to the zero matrix. Overall, going back to the top, the anti-commutator of sigma 1 and sigma 2 is equal to zero. Let's make some room. We could repeat this exercise for all other possible pairs of Pauli matrices, and I really encourage you to try it out. But we will again simply write out the final result which is that the anti-commutator between sigma 2 and sigma 3 is equal to the anti-commutator between sigma 3 and sigma 1, and both vanish. By contrast, the anti-commutator between sigma 1 with itself 
is equal to two times the identity matrix, and so are the anti-commutators of sigma 2 with itself and of sigma 3 with itself. So we can summarize these expressions as the anti-commutator of sigma j and sigma k being equal to 2 times delta jk times the identity matrix, where j and k run from 1 to 3. This term here is the Kronecker delta symbol. You'll remember that the Kronecker delta symbol is equal to 1 when j equals k and equals 0 otherwise. Let's finish with a brief summary of all the main results. The Pauli matrices are defined as shown up here. They are Hermitian, involuntary, and unitary. The determinant is equal to minus 1, and the trace vanishes. The eigenvalues of all Pauli matrices are plus 1 and minus 1, and their eigenvectors are listed here. Finally, the commutation relations of the Pauli matrices can be summarized by this expression. As an example, the commutator of sigma 1 and sigma 2 is equal to 2i times sigma 3, while the commutator of sigma 1 and sigma 1 vanishes. The anti-commutation relations can be summarized by this expression, and as examples, the anti-commutator of sigma 1 and sigma 2 vanishes, while the anti-commutator between sigma 1 and sigma 1 is equal to 2 times the identity matrix. We've introduced several mathematical properties of the Pauli matrices, and you will see that they will be extremely useful in our study of quantum mechanics. You can follow some of the links below to study some of these applications. And that's it for today. If you like the video, please subscribe.